Greetings. Welcome to episode four of Indiana's Timeless Tales. The series currently comprises five books with the sixth with the sixth and the final stages of production that tell the story of Indiana from prehistory until the end of the American Revolution. The podcast necessarily omits some of the information from the printed volume, so those interested in all of the materials, you can find it in the book Indiana's Timeless Tales Prehistory to 1781. This episode relates a brief history of the French and Indian War, known in Europe as the Seven Years' War. All wars have to have a beginning somewhere. Most historians regard the Battle of Jumonville Glen as the opening battle of the Seven Years' War. George Washington played a central role in this battle. The French and the British both claimed the rich region of the Ohio River Valley. The Amerindian inhabitants that lived in the region shifted alliances between the two powers, depending upon which offered them the better bargain for their alliance. By the early part of the decade, their allegiance began to shift towards the British. However, it was a tenuous shift. When Virginia Governor Robert Dinwiddie had sent George Washington on his mission to warn the French to leave the Ohio River Valley region in October 1753, Washington had passed through the forks of the Ohio area on his way to Fort LaBeouf. This area had impressed him as the ideal place to build a fort. Thus, when Dinwiddie had wanted to fortify the area, he acted upon his trusted colonial officer's recommendation and ordered Captain William Trent and a company of colonial militia to build a fort at the site. Trent had arrived in mid-February and began constructing the fort that the British would call Prince Fort George. In March 1754, Dinwiddie ordered Washington to gather a force together to reinforce Trent's company at Fort Prince George and begin building a road. Washington complied, departing for the area by April the 2nd, 1754, with 160 men. More militia joined him at Winchester. Unknown to Dinwiddie and Washington, a French force of five to 600 soldiers had arrived at Prince, Fort Prince George on April the 17th and forced Trent, with his far smaller force, to leave. The French tore down Fort Prince George and began construction of the larger Fort Duquesne. Upon informing Washington of these developments, Trent joined Washington's force to return to the forks of the Ohio to, to build the road Dinwiddie wanted. Washington's force had built the road to an area called Great Meadows, a marshy clearing in the forest, by May the 14th. With a base camp here to store supplies, he began sending out scout, scouting parties to explore the area while waiting for Dinwiddie to send more troops. One of the scouting parties, led by Washington's companion on the December 2nd mission to Fort LaBush, LaBeouf, Robert Gist, discovered that a French scouting party was operating in the area. One of Washington's native allies, a Mingo chief called Tanacherison, or Half King, suggested Washington should lead a force to ambush the party. Because of the tenuous relationship between the natives and the British, Washington agreed to retain support of the chief. Various accounts of the battle that followed blur many of the details. By one account, Washington's force of about 75 men surrounded the French force, numbering about 40. Shots were fired and a battle of about 15 minutes ensued. Washington prevailed, his men killing about 10 of the French and forcing the surrender of the remainder. After the surrender, Tenet Cherison allegedly walked up to the commander of the French party, Joseph Coulon de Villiers de Jumonville, and struck him in the head. The blow killed the officer. This act would play a major role in the war that followed. Washington fell back to Fort Necessity and began reinforcing the structure. The Battle of Great Metals at Fort Necessity slapped young Colonel George Washington with his first and only battlefield surrender. It also served as the opening battle in a world war that became known as the Seven Years' War. In colonial America, this war would be the French and Indian War. The campaign was Washington's first experience wielding a military force. After his men finished the construction, he realized that Fort Necessity was in a bad position. It occupied boggy soil in the center of a depression. His men had only cut the tree line back to about 100 yards. At that raid, the besieging French troops could hide in the forest and fire down on the fort from cover. They could also charge downhill. He did not have time to rectify his position. French commander Louis Colon de Fouliers led French troops. He was during the earlier Battle of Jumonville, Glen, Jumonville Glen, an Indian had killed his younger brother, 
Ensign, Ensign Joseph Coulion de Villiers during the Washington's interrogation. Louis Villiers considered the death a murder and wanted vengeance. Under orders from his superior, Washington's men had built a road through the wilderness to allow troops to move towards the area. This road did help the reinforcing troops arrive from the east. On June the 9th, the remainder of the Virginia militia followed, followed by a hundred more British regulars a week later. Washington's force now numbered about 400 men and nine swivel guns. On June the 16th, Washington led 300 of his men out of Fort Necessity to continue work on the road for the additional reinforcements he believed would arrive. His intelligence from Fort Duquesne led him to believe that there were only 500 French troops there and that these had inferior training. After the Battle of Jumonville Glen, Washington's Amerindian allies had largely deserted him. He needed those reinforcements badly. Some of the natives did continue to supply Washington with intelligence about French movements, and from reports he decided to read back the, retreat back to Fort Necessity. The troops arrived there on July the 1st, 1754. The militia began to work improving the defensive works around the fort and enlarging the perimeter. They attempted to dig defensive trenches, but these quickly filled in water with water in the boggy soil. On July 3rd, 600 French troops and 100 native warriors arrived in the forest surrounding Fort Necessity. They had used the road Washington's troops had painstakingly cut through the forest. They occupied the high ground around the fort and poured a relentless fire into it. The attack continued throughout the day and Washington's casualties mounted. A pouring rain arrived, wetting the gunpowder. His situation dire, Washington remembered the ferocity of the Indians he had seen in battle. There were over a hundred warriors among the besiegers. His military career just might be coming to an end. Louis Colon de Villiers received a report that a large British force was closing in on the site. It was a false report, but de Villiers could not know this. Not wishing to get caught by vengeful British troops discovering a massacre or hurting a line of prisoners, de Villiers sent mess sent Washington, sent messengers to besiege Washington late in the evening. He offered to allow Washington and his troops to depart the fort unarmed. The negotiations took a lot of time, as de Villiers did not speak English and sent Washington did not read French. He was not aware that de Villiers had inserted a clause in which Washington admitted to the murder of Ensign Joseph Coleon de Villiers while a prisoner of war. The French would use this admission of guilt as a powerful propaganda tool in the coming war. Washington lost about 30 men during the battle. He marched his remaining troops out of the fort on the morning of July the 4th, 1754. The French burned the fort. The battle had disastrous consequences for the British. They had no outposts of any kind left in the important Ohio River Valley, and war beckoned. The French and Indian War had begun with a French victory over an inexperienced 22-year-old George Washington in Pennsylvania on May the 28th, 1754, at the Battle of Jumonville Glen. It ended with the last North American battle, the Battle of Signal Hill in Nova Scotia on September the 15th, 1760. In the in intervening years, the French had lost an empire. The Treaty of Paris, finalized on February the 10th, 1763, saw the end of French presence in North America and the beginning of British dominance. Under the terms of the treaty, the French ceded Canada, Dominica, Grenada, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, and the tobacco to Britain. The terms also gave the entire eastern Mississippi River Basin to the British. This region included the Ohio River Valley region that had been the original source of the Troubles. France retained fishing rights off Newfoundland, Newfoundland and the French inhabitants of Canada guaranteed to practice their Catholic faith. The Treaty of Paris eliminated French competition in North America and the resulting less intent should have led to peace. However, the colonists in North America had learned that they could govern themselves. Brady, the vast welcome debt to episode by four Britain led, to, led it to impose tales. taxes the on the colonists to pay for it. Five books the colonists bristled at these with the sixth and quote, the final taxation of without representation. Tell the story unquote. of Indiana from pre The British also the wanted to maintain a large standing army in North America, leading to some suspicions the among the colonists about their motives. Thus, the ending of one war led to the conditions that began another a dozen years later. 
This episode Find out more about Indiana history by the first seeing the book War, Indiana's in Timeless Europe Tales: Prehistory to 1781. All wars have to the have a beginning. The somewhere. early history of the Most Indiana of the story from the time the glaciers melted until the final the days of the, of the opening battle of the Seven Years' War. The book in George sketches of blade tribes that inhabited this battle. As well the as French, French and the British outpost both claim the rich region of the time. Ohio River you can Valley. Find it on my website, www.mossyandbeachbooks.com, is between the Indian powers, State Park depending travel upon which offer them the better bargain for their alliance. Uh, By the early links part of the to Amazon, decade. Barnes and Noble, Google Play, and other online booksellers, you may choose to purchase the book in ebook or softbound versions. An audiobook version is also available on Google Play. Residents of southeastern Indiana can find my books at the Walnut Street Variety Store on George Street in Batesville. At the conclusion of this series, I will compile the episodes into an audiobook. The audiobook will be available on Audible, Amazon, Apple, Barnes & Noble, as well as many other audiobook sellers. You can also order the books direct from me, the author, on the website. If you wish me to sign the book, just send me an email to mossyfeetbooks at gmail.com requesting a signed book and instructions on how you want me to address it. Note, if you send me an email, I will add you to my contact list. Readers on the list will receive an email from me announcing when I publish a new book. If you do not want me to add you to the list, tell me and I will not add you. Listeners to this podcast that want email notifications of my new releases can just send me an email requesting addition to the list. You can choose to have your name removed at any time. If you browse the website, you will find sample chapters, one for each of my books. The next episode will recount the story of Daniel Boone and the opening of Kentucky. I hope you enjoyed this podcast, and thank you for listening.